What's happening guys, this is James Blonde with MMOHuts.com This time we're taking a first look at Hero of the Obelisk from GVE Games Now this game is sort of a mix or hybrid MMORPG and dungeon crawler with cutesy anime characters And it sort of reminds me of games like Dragon's Nest or Legend of Edda combined Anyway, the game just went into closed beta and the keys are flying out of our giveaway So I'll spend a short while showing off the game's features and making some comments along the way Alright, so the game offers three choices when it comes to classes. You've got the Swordsman, which is, you know, of course your melee damage dealing class using a variety of swords, two-handed or dual, or, you know, in combination with a shield. The Scholar, which is derived from your typical mage, with choices of either playing the role of support and healing or a powerful caster. And the Adventurer, which is a pretty broad class that covers gunslingers, uh, hunter type classes with stealth capabilities, all the way to engineer type classes that use deployable turrets. But the nice thing is that the classes aren't really set in stone. Players get to decide what role to shape them into with some of the gear that they equip them with or the abilities they learn over time. Like with the swordsman, you can play the tanky fighter role with the sword and shield, or you can pick up a two-handed sword for the more bruiser type role. The same thing goes for the other classes. Now with the adventure, you have a slightly wider range of roles to work with. And as you continue playing along the path you've decided, each of the classes branches out and evolves with new, more powerful skills at the various higher levels. That's pretty typical in a game like this. In total, there are 18 different specializations. So even though there are only three classes to choose from right at the beginning, you've still got plenty of variety to work with finding the role you want to play. Now, as you can see here, the good news that you guys want to hear is that the classes are not gender-based, which is something that tends to be common with dungeon crawlers for some reason. They are gender-based. The customization at the moment is fairly basic. You've got options for hair and, you know, hair color, along with several variations of the eyes, which claims to be the, you know, face, but there's not a whole lot of change there. But it's usually to be expected in games with the cutesy, chibi art styles. I mean, other than maybe the ability to change the colors in the outfit, I can't really think of what I'd like to see them have. Besides, as you pick up gear, the appearance of your outfit changes pretty drastically, and this happens pretty much right after the first dungeon or so, so it's not really that big of a deal. Costumes also play a big part in this game. As you can see here, I'm dressed up as a man bear pig. Alright, so as you start out, you have a choice to go through a tutorial which teaches you the basics and rewards you afterwards, but directly after that, uh, you're put in the first town area where you immediately pick up a quest to do the level 1 dungeon. Of course, the objective is to kill X number of bad guys, but it gets you into the feel of the combat and used to your skills. Something it doesn't directly do in the tutorial for some reason. But, one nice thing about the game is that you have complete control over the camera. You can zoom in close, and I definitely like the way the, the, you know, the game looks visually. They did a good job with that. I like how the background blurs off in the distance as you get close. And uh, the game also features a few systems already implemented that are unique, like this here. My icon is a heart, and if I party with other players that also have this icon, I get bonuses. Uh, that's pretty cool. And it's randomized, you know, so it may be different all the time. Another cool feature, and I guess this is just a temporary in-game event, I'm not really sure, but there are these newbie scarecrows and these speedy little loot pigs that you can just attack whenever you want. Uh, and they drop gold and silver bars, which are actually worth quite a bit. They just kind of randomly show up, but they do so pretty often, and uh, they're pretty much everywhere as well. Even in the dungeons themselves, the only thing is, is that if you attack one in a crowded area, expect everybody and their dog to pick up the gold before you actually get a chance to. You gotta be quick. So the town layout is pretty nice, with two places for dungeon entry, and several of the NPCs are located around the central fountain, and it makes it easy to get to. All of the other ones are easily located on the map, with an auto-track feature, which I think comes in handy. You know, you can actually click, especially in a game like this, you can click on an NPC where you need to go, it shows you which one you need from the map itself, and you can kind of search through your inventory while you get there. In a game like this, it's pretty handy. Each of the classes has their own unique class master you can purchase spellbooks from, and when you've reached the level that you can acquire a new skill, it lets you know so you can purchase the skillbook accordingly. Now, as you can see here, you've got your typical dungeon selection screen that shows you each of the individual dungeons, their level, and whether or not your quest objective is located there. And it's cool, it shows you kind of a preview of what the dungeon looks like here, and you can choose whether or not to go in solo or with a party. And so as you get into the first couple of dungeons, you'll notice that the controls in the game are pretty standard. You move with WASD or by left clicking, and you can't really turn that off. You can't really turn off the clicking, which is kind of annoying, at the moment anyway. And of course, you're casting spells with 1 through 9, but the controls, I've got to say, they, they feel a bit odd compared to most dungeon crawlers. See, you're playing a game that claims to be a dungeon crawler, or a hack and slash as they want to call it, but... The combat is more like your standard MMORPG tab targeting, so it's really a just, it's just a point and click sort of combat. You control the direction of most of your skills by aiming them, like, you know, kind of like this here. 
and uh, they, they show telegraphs, which I think is cool. I just wasn't really expecting it. I was looking for more of the Heroes Go type of combat, but this game has you select your target for your basic attack or use a standard skill by aiming it. And if you're not close enough, you know, if you're not within range, you'll automatically move a little bit closer. The cool thing to go along with this is that the enemies also indicate where they're going to strike with telegraphs, which is a plus because it gives you time to avoid it. However, when you do get hit by these, it doesn't really seem to do a whole lot of damage at the moment. And as you'll see, this is kind of what makes the boss battles repetitive over time. Now, I've got to say that the jump is actually pretty entertaining. It kind of makes you look like Sonic the Hedgehog turning into a little ball and doing flips, but it also helps you get up to certain areas on the map for loot chests and other stuff like switches and things to open up gates. So after you get through slaughtering the hundreds of cutesy looking bad guys, you end up at the boss room where you typically run into an oversized versions of what you've fought before, along with his fearsome, or cute, whichever you prefer, minions. And after you take down that tanky monster of a boss, the stage loot system is actually pretty cool. The chances of you getting a fairly rare item is pretty high, but you also have the choice to reserve that item so that way you have the chance to increase the rarity of the next item you receive from the next dungeon you complete. Otherwise, you can take the item, granted you have the inventory space, because that's one of the first things that you'll notice in the game, is the lack of inventory space. Even from the first few dungeons, you loot so much stuff that it fills up your inventory quick. You know, that and the 10 or so items you get from the gift boxes, but most of the loot you find is consumables or crafting materials or items for all the other classes except yours. It seems anyways. It's actually pretty even. But the nice thing is from the start you have free access to storage from one of the merchants in town, but you'll notice that you'll be selling or storing items pretty much after each set of dungeon quests. But like I said before, the gear in the game plays a big part and you can really tell the difference when you get a more powerful weapon or a tougher piece of armor for at least a little while. But later on, past level 10, you can enchant your gear, and the nice thing, along with everything else you pick up or get rewarded for, uh, plenty, you get plenty of enchantment stones. In fact, the daily rewards give you uh, only enchantment stones. It's the only thing you can get from the daily rewards. But they're all based on levels, though, so you may or may not be able to use them at the time. Otherwise, you can just kind of store them or sell them. Currently, the game doesn't have a cash shop, but from the looks of things, there's definitely going to be some costumes and booster potions for sale. The game does have a fatigue system that seems to be getting on everybody's nerves, and it keeps them from entering dungeons after a certain period of time, even though it takes many hours to actually run into that problem. And I suppose, in this case, it's there because they either didn't remove it from the Korean port over and want to keep North American players on a slower progression so that way they have time to produce more content so players don't burn through it all too fast, or they'll sell a fatigue potion in the cash shop, or they'll use it as a gold sink. And one other thing that the game has that's implemented already is PvP. They've got co-op team-based battlefield matches and siege battle. Uh, plus they've got another one that's in development that is more objective-based. You get access to this and a lot of things at level 10, which really doesn't take that long because of all the XP bonus potions and closed beta, but the game also has open world PvP, which I know a lot of players are looking for, especially with this sort of art style and play style. So I've got to say, overall the game isn't bad, it's actually pretty entertaining, and it keeps your attention for a little while. It's got a lot of features players are looking for in this type of MMORPG, and to be honest, it's better than a lot of games that are put out recently. Like I said, it's basically a tab-targeting combat system with dungeon crawler mobs that get aggroed really easily, so it's a little too clunky, I think, to be called a hack and slash. But, I mean, I mean come on, it's, it's a point and click, which allows for the boss fights to get a little repetitive. You just kind of attack and spam potions, or, I don't know, you can kite them around a little bit to make it interesting. But either way, the game is in an odd way fun and addicting. It's, it seems to be pretty popular in closed beta, the servers are pretty packed, uh, enough to lag a bit, and on top of that we can't keep the keys in our closed beta key giveaway, so that's gotta say something. Anyway guys, thanks for watching, if you're looking for more information about Hero of the Obelisk, follow the links in the description below, check out the game profile at mmohuts.com, and if you're wanting to check out the game yourself, keep an eye on the beta key giveaway we've got going on. The closed beta lasts until the 20th, so you still got some time. But until next time guys, that's gonna be it for me, I'm James Blonde. See you out there, gamers.